Thanks so much. Thank it's a pleasure to to be uh, to be back here uh, again. You know, and I I, I enjoy this uh, you know somewhat uh, eclectic uh, group of folks. Um, so what, what I want to talk about is uh, you know a theme that I've been on for 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 some time. Um, you know, look, looking at uh, processors and systems you know really in a in a big system context and big data and in particular in in memory big data computing and and i'm i'm going to start by by looking at uh, at memory cost <clears throat> and relating that to uh, to to what we do in power systems so so i looked uh, actually just this morning <laughs> i went to uh, memory.net you know for the the price of of dram and you know, came out pretty much what what I expected, right? If you have uh, 32 gig or 64 gigabyte uh, DDR4 DIMMs, you pay somewhere between four and six dollars street price. Um, if you go to 128 gigabyte, you know that jumps to roughly twice that number. You know, around ten bucks or so per gigabyte. And and if you go to 256 gigabyte. Well, they weren't even listed there as standard things you know you're into sort of special build kind of things and they get really really expensive and and, and what's behind that is that uh, you know for these these higher capacity memory dims you have to use DRAMs that are that are stacked you know and, and as you make these just just like when you make chips bigger if you make stack stacks higher you know they yield less and at some point you hit some kind of a limit and it, it really gets difficult to to make them which makes them more expensive which means not too many people buy them which makes them even more expensive and so on right so that that puts a limit on on memory capacity so uh, in this picture you see on on the right hand side you know a traditional uh, dim and on the left hand side uh, the uh, the dims that we are using in uh, in power systems Right. So power systems already for, for quite a while, you know, we've been building our own uh, uh, memory, uh, buffered memory DIMMs. And, and we've been doing it recently in, in Power 10 uh, based on an open, open uh, standard, right? based on the open CAPI standard. This is, these are uh, uh, OMI you know, based on the open CAPI memory interface. What you what you see here is a you, you know a, 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 the smallest one of those things, uh, and you see that it's uh, you know it's it's kind of comparable to to what you might get on a on a DDR here. Mm -hmm. um, however, you, you know these uh, these things that we build we build them in in a, in a in a number and actually I should say you know Mike microchip actually built the the buffer in in the in the power ten generation. Um, and and we build not not only the, the kind of regular form factor uh, dims, but we build taller ones as well. And, and, and as you can see, um, you know the, the the biggest one here, you know you can put considerably more chips on it than on the small one. You know obviously, mm -hmm. so so that real estate now allows you to build say a two fifty six or maybe even a five twelve gigabyte dim. While the chips that you use are, are the same kinds of chips that you would find in the 32 and 64 gigabyte dims now, right? So there isn't that intrinsic reason, you know, that the that the price is going to explode on you if you build a 256 or 512 gigabyte dim, you know, for a for a power uh, power system. So that gives us. Uh, I mean, it has it has other advantages. There are reliability advantages and. And, and and so on, but it but it gives you a, a capacity, uh, a, a pretty fundamental capacity advantage. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, CXL. Right, what is what is going on there? Is um, uh, the uh, there is a, uh, a form factor that's being pursued that that I think actually originally came kind of out, out of the Gen Z world, which is this uh, EDSF. F uh, E3.S form factor, and you, you know they're they're building uh, CXL memory modules, you know, based on that form factor, 
And, and as you can see here, you, you know, it, it's actually not too different, you know, from what an, uh, what an IBM OMI DIM uh, looks like. And, and, and even the, the connector down here, I mean, so the arms is a little bit wider. Um, the connector, actually, the physical connector is the same as these two tabs <laughs> on, on the other ones, right? I mean, we, 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 we too, you know, like to reuse standard components when we can, right, to, to reduce the, the cost of our, our servers and so on, right? So the, the connectors and so on, um, uh, it's not too surprising to find a similarity there. You know, the, the placement of it on the card isn't exactly the same, but these, these things are, are, are pretty, you know, pretty similar. Um, so, you know, here is a, a picture of an... Uh, of an IBM system. This is actually the uh, uh, the the E ten fifty that we launched not too long ago. And what you see here is, is so these are the products here. This is one row of thirty two of those ten. This is another row of thirty two of those ten. So that gives you sixty four uh, dims in an in a, on the on the motherboard, right? Which you know if you have a an, an Intel really dense motherboard, maybe you'd find 48 DIMMs that I think is just about the biggest number you, you might find on an Intel motherboard. Something like 24 or 32 is a lot more common. So 64 is bigger, you know, than, than, than 48. Um, but, you know, that, that, that height difference uh, amounts, you know, gives you another multiplier factor, right, in, the, in this three to four range, I would say. Uh, so to this gives you a tremendous amount of, of memory, you know, on a on a single plane, and, and in fact, this this box uh, with uh, with two fifty six gigabyte DIMMs can can get up to uh, sixteen terabytes, um, and and you know it's easy to imagine that you could that you could build a, a five twelve gig uh, DIMM in this form factor without having to go to you know ridiculously dense DRAM chips to to do it. So, so that that's that's a you know that's a ton of ton, a ton of memories right in in a in in a in a system. Um, so, okay, what what have I said here so far, right? So, the, these OMI games it actually gives you you know about about four four times as much DRAM you know for the for the similar amount of uh, board space. You can get to these memory capacities per DIM, you know, that, that are, are just ridiculously expensive if you do it another way with, while using components that are, are still quite standard. Uh, the, the OMI channel, and, and you know, when you, when you looked at the, the memory card that we have, that's a by eight interface, right? The CXL module that looks similar actually can go to a by 16. But even with the by eight, we have enough bandwidth there to actually support two DRAM channels on the back end, right? So, uh, and if you went to a by 16, we have enough bandwidth, bandwidth there for four DRAM channels on the back end. So, so not only, you know, would I argue that we can support something like four times the memory capacity, can also support four times the memory bandwidth, you know, within the form factor that we have. And, and if you see how, constrained the x86 world is you know in terms of being able to provide the memory bandwidth to the processors you know this is a this is the kind of headroom that, that i i think you know most server vendors can only dream about right um, so um and and i i showed you how, how we get you know 64 of these dims in a in a standard 19 inch rack thing. Now, but by the way, that, that box, you know, if, if I load that up with, with uh, 16 terabytes, you know, let, let alone, I mean, 16 terabytes is the max that we, that we offer. Uh, but like I said, it, it wouldn't be a, a major challenge to, to build one with, with 32 terabytes. You know, that, that box is totally dominated by the memory cost, right? So yes, there's, you know, some power processes in there, but that box is dominated by the memory cost. And the other thing I would point out to this audience is that, you know, because we've made these, all this open, open copy stuff, uh, you know, freely available and actually recently brought it into the CXL consortium, 
you know, just just like you've heard talks here about people building open power cores, you know, into FPGAs and doing interesting things with that. And uh, you know, there's there's other people that have been building uh, these OMI interfaces into FPGAs and building things like that. Right. So you can you can do a lot of things in this space with with open open source uh, you know technology. Um, and and so what I would argue is you know that 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 factor of four is uh, is a <laughs> you know that matters right so um, what what you see is is a lot of servers and 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 processor roadmaps going to ridiculous number of of cores but, but without really the infrastructure around it to support it and I. I um, you know, the, the AMD Genoas uh, processors were, were announced a, a few days ago. And, and it's, you know, it's an absolutely impressive processor. The, the box, the, the maximum the box supports today, these two socket servers is three terabytes. <laughs> you know, that's not a very impressive number. And then you can say, okay, well, with CXL, maybe you know, that technology doesn't give you the same kinds of latencies that we have with these OMI DMs. But if I would want to, you know, begin to come anywhere close to the kinds of system that I showed, you have to build a separate box, you know, with a, a bunch of CXL in there and then hope, you know, that the latency out to that, you know, isn't larger than what you want to have. Right. So 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 I'm I I, I my, my my personal bet is okay, you know, at some point, yes, the industry will probably stretch out DDR for longer than it should. But this CXL, you know, memory form factor is a, a nice industry standard form factor. And, and in our experience, when I mean, you build servers with a decent number of cores, you know, that's actually how you want to build your memory subsystem, not, not with these, these DDR uh, channels that we use today. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I'm just guessing that at some time, some, sometime in the next five to 10 years, right? standard memory will will begin to look like what, what I am, I'm showing here and, and, and by the way you know we, we 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 are trying to you know help make this possible right uh, so so the the open copy foundation you know ceased its independent operation became a you know we brought the IP into this CSL uh, standard and so at least there it's possible right to to bring this stuff uh, uh, together in the future and, and and i think you you see that there are some companies uh you know at uh, at supercomputing that are beginning to already do some things bringing these uh, these technologies together yeah. oh. uh, well did so i mean the, the open copy is not all not the same as open power right they're two independent things yeah so so to then, you know, another thing that uh, um, so 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 I I showed you, you know, how with the technology that we use on the power systems, you can get a tremendous amount of memory in a in, in a single enclosure. But we've also been innovating on how to get a memory space that that goes beyond the enclosure to something that you might call, you know, um, uh, cluster shared memory or, or or something like that. Right, and the, the fundamental underneath here is that we have been using our open cafe interface to attach accelerators to a host system. When we do that, the accelerator uses an, uh, a virtual address, that's actually an effective address because power has you know, two level address translation. And on the memory side, there is this all in my interface, which is a you know subset actually of Open Capi, where you come out with a with a real address, right? You're going to pick that device with a with a real address, not with an uh, an effective address. So what you can think of, you can think of a power chip now as a as a as a router, right? Based on the I come in with a virtual address, it gets translated to a real address, and based on that real address, I'm going to come out one of the memory ports, right? What a particular Open Capi port on the other end. So, so if I if I now take that real address and map it back into a virtual address that, the, that some other server understands, or already has a compatible interface, I can just plug it into the next guy, 
And if I organize my, my address translation in, in such a way that, for example, you know, I have some agreement on which virtual address range is ultimately going to hit a physical address range of a particular server, you know, I, I can I can network together a whole bunch of servers and, and use you know have a have a single addressing space across all of that. So that's gonna work, right? It's not gonna be coherent though. It's not an SMP, right? This this is but it it'll it'll allow me to do load stores to it's actually up to something like two two petabytes. Right? So this technology is baked into our power 10 chips. It's not something that we ship enabled in, in our power 10 servers today, but it's a you know it's a very, very interesting capability. My, my one of my other hacks is is I, I'm a part time professor at Delft University, and I believe last year when I was here, I talked about some work that was what we did with a Power Nine prototype, which all, all by the way it's called Tamisis Flow, and that's all in open source as well. And we took Power Nine systems and with some FPGAs created an equivalent of of the capability that's baked into the silicon on Power Ten. So. Um, yeah, this this is just some of, of the, the things that you can do with that cluster shared memory, right? If you're in a cloud type of environment, they can amortize instead of having to, you know, uh, outfit every processor, every system with the maximum amount of memory it might ever need, right? You you outfit it with something closer to the average and you steal from your neighbors, right? When you when one particular one needs a little bit more, um, you know, and you can you can do all kinds of topologies, including, you know, taking our, our our biggest servers, which can support up to 64 terabytes in a single enclosure and, you know, networking them together uh, this way to, to go up to something like a two terabyte uh, addressable space. You know, the, the other thing that I point out here is that, you know, as, as we are bringing this technology into the CXL consortium, right, the, you know, we, we anticipate more capability also in the future, right, to to use this con technology in combination with the technology there and, and start using power systems, for example, as memory servers in the context of a, of a system that might also have uh, x86 or ARM or RISC-V uh, componentry. Okay, so... You know, I, I promised to talk a, a little bit about uh, big data in, in the last 10 minutes here. Uh, that, that, is, that is what I, I will talk about. So, so, so I, 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 now I showed you how, how I believe that the, the, the power systems, we, they kind of have some, some fundamental advantages in building systems with, you know, a lot of memory. So the next question is, okay, well, what do you do with that? You know, one obvious answer for power is, you know, online memory databases, right? Uh, that's that's a, a, a big business for us on, on, on our power systems. And I hope I hope it's kind of obvious to you now, you know, why somebody might want to do a HANA database on a, on a power system. But, you know, I, I, I think this is, this, this is just the beginning, right? So, so what I'm really intrigued by is, okay, if I can build systems with, with so much memory and be so effective at sharing it, I, I, I want to think about, you know, having, having a big memory, not just within a single application, like a database. I want to think about that memory the way we think about storage and file systems today, right? So... So, so, so I, I want I want multiple programs <clears throat> to be able to communicate with each other through that memory, without having to do the serialization deserialization that is associated with going through the memory subsystem. Right. So, uh, we we've been working on that uh, in in Delft uh, as as well. And uh, you know, one one of the things that you're going to need is if you're going to have multiple applications talk to each other you know, through the data shared in, in memory rather than a file system, you're going to have to, to agree on, on how that data is formatted, right? And, you know, the Apache Arrow doesn't cover everything, but at least in for, for columnar-oriented uh, tables. And, you know, it is actually fairly generic there. I mean, there's nested tables and so on. Um, you know, that gives you such a, a standard, right? That, that tells you, you know, exactly how the data is laid out in memory. 
and, and I, I believe maybe also last time I spoke here, I talked about you know building some some things with accelerators and open capi that go after these uh, Apache arrow tables. So it it helps there in, if you want to to get to data from an accelerator, but it also helps in this in this bigger context, right? Right, where I might have a, a cluster shared memory system. I already talked about the uh, the, the hardware standards. Um, Okay, I'm going to cover the acceleration piece. And so, so Apache Arrow is, uh, you know, standardized format. It's it's, it's quite, quite a significant community around it, supported by many programming languages and frameworks. Um, and I wanted to talk about an example of something that, uh, you know, one one of the uh, the PhD students that I that I co-advised actually finished up last year. What he did was, I think, a very interesting example. So when you have a, a genomics uh, uh, flow, right, there are uh, several different uh, phases in there. You know, where you take the um, you, you know the, the the snippets and you have to sort them, and then you have to you know, mark duplicates and so on. There is, a, there is a sort of a standard way of going through that. And typically what you do is after each of these phase, you you take the data and you write it back to the file system and you read it back in, right? And then you do the next phase, et cetera, right? And, and, and what, what this student did is, is did it all through memory and standardized on this Apache Arrow data format. And, you know, we started with the and uh, that after you after you do this kind of optimization and you take a flow like this uh, and do it through memory you know you end up with those those green type bars over there right so it can indeed give you a very substantial uh, savings right to to get away from this paradigm of you know sequential kind of storage you know realize that you have a you have a random addressable memory out there Right. So, so this is this is not the same, right? As taking your file system and and just mapping it onto a piece of it to DRAM. Yes, it helps, right? But it's not, you know, you still have to do the serialization, the serialization going after that. This is this is much more efficient than that. Okay, so that 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 is an example uh, showing that this this stuff actually really uh, really works and really helps. And. Uh, uh, I've I've included some some references uh, to papers and, and so on about this. I thought I'd leave uh, five minutes for questions and discussion. <laughs> This is changing the way that we can handle the process to treat this as practice on the versus here's the kind of thing that we need to do. What do you think the cost is going to really be? Do you prohibit it? No, I, yeah, so, so no, I don't think it's too pretty prohibitive, right? I, I think, you, you know, that. That difference between the you know which type of DRAM chips you use, right, and how much real estate you have, depending on the I mean, that that that's already a, easily a factor of two, right. And if you push further, and you know you get into ex exponential stuff there, um, if if you if you then connect these systems together, and you're able to so so for example, uh, I think there's a Google, uh, I think it was a Google paper that estimated. So, so, so there's papers from the likes of Google, Amazon, others that estimate that sort of 30 to 50 percent of the memory is stranded because you, you know, your your average is not your worst case. Um, so that's another something that approximates a factor of two, right? So there's a huge savings to have, be had, you know, to, to organize your systems more efficiently. The, the biggest hurdles here, as as it usually is, is you know that there is a you know, fairly sizable soft software ecosystem, right? And, and and the way that people write their applications and all that, right? Uh, 
I mean, Apache Arrow is a terribly helpful standard, but not everything is a polymer oriented table. So there's still more work to do there. Here's uh, uh, on the um, I opened up, you mentioned I open here and see the nodes. Is there do you have? Um, I, I have seen this before uh, earlier. I don't know you, but is there what kind of how, do you, how is the uh, I consistency maintained and is it lazily done? And, and no, so yeah, so so. You know, actually, in, in, so physically, it's using the same kind of cables and things that we would use to build an SMP, right? But if you build an SMP, you can only get to a to a certain scale, right? And with and with this, you can, you know, we can add ex, extra hops without having to slow everything down because our Snoop protocols, you know, now have to reach out further, you know, to come back and so on, right? Um, but but it does mean that so for example if you do memory stealing right if you if you have one of these cloud type scenarios and your worry is that you know your the most amount of memory per node might be four terabytes that you need but the average is two you'd like to actually build each node with two terabytes instead of four terabytes and steal from your neighbors is that if that's how you're using it it's fully coherent. It's just that some of your memory has a, a little bit higher latency than some some other pieces of memory, which is a a, a numa type uh, behavior, right? But it's not ridiculous because an extra hop here is of the, of the order of you know an extra hop in in our SMPs, right? And and, and we, we we get away with that in in uh, you know by by, by doing prefetching and, and and other kinds of things. But but if I if I start to to share the data, sorry, here's my. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I if I start to 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 share the data, of course, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be. You, you'd have to make it software coherent, right, A across enclosures, because it's only going to be coherent within the next enclosure. Now, something that's also interesting about uh, Apache Arrow that 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 I I, I failed to mention, and probably should have, is it's it's uh, it's meant to be immutable, right? So. Um, you know, it's a, it's it's a data structure that you that you create and augment, but you don't you don't modify that data typically, right? Which is just one particular mechan mechanism by which you can keep things uh, software coherent. 